Welcome to I and I Studio. I'm Diane Williams. I'm Chuck Potter. This is Chuck's studio. Uh, we have uh, studios across the hall from each other. He does plaster in here. And it's a very different medium to work with than acrylic. His um, work has very little paint pigment, if any, in most of the pieces. Um, and it's a, a, a very um, involved process. So people are always asking you to teach classes. And up until this point, you haven't been interested. What are some of the logistic problems that you think you can have with a workshop like this? Well, one of the, well, there's several. One, um, it's time-based. Um, plaster is not something that you can sit down and just work a piece for, you know, three or four hours and, and have a, a product. It's, it's one that, you know, takes time for it to dry, uh, much like clay. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to, you know, do it in stages. Um, there's, you know, many benefits to um, doing things in stages. We teach that a lot in our painting workshops um, because I've also painted for, you know, 25 years and, uh, and we do, uh, I do still paint, but primarily my work is focused on plaster because I like the, the surface, I like the physicality of it, uh, especially with my construction background. Um, so for this fun. very first introduction uh, to plaster class, we're going to offer it on five consecutive evenings, um, two and a half hours per class. So um, that way the plaster will have time to dry in between classes and give people surfaces to work on when they come back. Right, in the stages. In the stages. Right, and then, you know, we, we also plan to have advanced classes a little later on because there's a developed several techniques over the last several years um, where, uh, you know, at first it was, you know, plaster and paint, and then it was plaster and then staining techniques, and then it was um, plaster and other materials. I, I put in a collage, I would transfer plasters, then it got into the point where I'm making um, almost like monotype prints with plasters, reliefs, and sanding back in, and then just pure plaster. So what are some of the reasons that people might want to learn plaster rather than or other than um, acrylic or another type of paint? Primarily texture. You know, for me, um, I see um, my visual experience is much more textural based than it is um, surface based. Um, not to say that surfaces don't, you know, have texture. It's just that um, I like a little more texture than the standard paint or gouache or um, material would normally, you know, watercolors would give you. What's the difference between texture and surface? Um, well, surface is, you know, is, is, a, is a thin layer and um, it, it has a very little physical 3D effect. Um, it has illusionary effects that, you know, can make it pop. And get depth. So you're talking about the difference between physical texture and um, visual texture. Correct. Okay. Right, right. So plaster, you're working with a, a real a physical texture. When I feel this, it's raised. I can feel what these these shapes are with my hands. Whereas with a lot of, say, my paintings, for example, you feel the surface. It's smooth, but it looks like it's textural, so that's vi visual texture, and this is physical texture. Right, and not that I don't um, use visual texture and surface te uh, texture and illusionary effects, because I can pull the plaster in the more advanced classes we'll be teaching. There's uh, other plasters that you can pull that are very thin, and they are like veiling. And uh, the nice thing about plaster is it has a, a an a, organic, quality to it. One of the, you know, uh, Diane and I are old oil painters and we've worked with oil and tar and we've worked with all these different kinds of material in the past and the thing we missed when we switched to acrylics was that organic nature and plaster has more of an organic nature to it than the plastic acrylic paints do. Um, and we still love acrylic paints and acrylic paints have come a long way, especially in the last 10 years or so, um, but still, um, 
Plaster allows you to set up a surface that stains, and I've always been fascinated with nature and the natural staining process because a stain leaves a history, mm -hmm. and it's a history of an actual occurrence. Um, and, and I like this sense of recorded history and the mystery of it. Um, so nature. how many types of plasters do you work with typically? Well, I've developed over... Um, the last several years, I've developed several. Um, the, the plasters that, that I use the most is just a basic plaster of Paris mixed with a wood pulp and um, uh, sand, and I can adjust the ratios along with um, a little bit of uh, molding paste so it has the ability not to crack and flex. I can actually use it on uh, canvas surfaces. Um, this here is a panel. Um, this here, um, you can see, is, is a canvas um, and it sets up nice and tight you can actually hear it but it's got enough flex to it so it doesn't crack and it adheres really well uh, that's a light molding paste um, and uh, then uh, the Venetian plaster um, this here is just primarily stained a regular plaster with uh, stained sumi ink and a rust solution that we use um, this here has a Venetian plaster uh, to it, so you can see um, the, the surface, and you can see how very thin it can be, and it can burnish. So you get these real translucent effects. Um, and what I like about plaster and why I used it generally was I was always dissatisfied, even as an acrylic painter, with the acrylic gesso surfaces, and I was mixing things like marble powder in them uh, to get these kind of staining effects, because I stain a lot with my uh, painting practice. And um, I just, you know, for me, the stains are organic and they really allude again back to nature, which is what my uh, work is based on. So I noticed on this surface that this part is very smooth and this part is rougher. Right. Um, how, how do you achieve that? Well, there's a lot of ways to achieve that. You can um, mix in sand um, as one. Um, generally with the Venetian plasters uh, that have a high marble base, um, I, I prefer to froth it. And that's a practice where I'll take the actual product as it comes and it's already uh, pre-mixed. Uh, and then I'll froth it with water um, I've been tempted to use baking soda and some other products to add air, and I noticed they were doing this in glass blowing. Uh, so I, I watch other TV shows, and I'm saying, "Wow, I wonder what that would do with plaster." But I can whip and froth it, and that's what I did with this uh, particular um, blue. That's if you see where it burnished it, it's really a, a beautiful dark blue. But by frothing it, it stayed kind of white. Did you so paint it blue? No, the, um, the plasters come pre-mixed in colors. Um, I get my product from a company called Fermilux, and they have, they have so many colors, it's much like acrylic paints. Yeah. And then you can go and choose, and if you have a color in mind that they don't have, um, you can contact them, and they will custom blend it for you. Um, it's, you know, it's about as, uh, ex it's probably even less expensive than paint. A gallon might run you $65, $70, mm -hmm. you know, and it'll last a long time. Um, and I've got, you know, 12 or 14 gallons of so, different colors that I use, much like you would buy tubes of paint. Will the students have to go out and get the plasters and bring them to the workshop, or how how is that going to work? Well, the way I plan to work the workshop is to provide all of the materials mm -hmm. and then um, uh, let the students uh, play with the different materials and then, you know, if they decide they want to continue on with this process, then they can order from Fermilux. And, you know, and I probably, after a couple orders with Fermilux, will try to work out, you know, some sort of uh, discount price and some volume purchases, maybe. You know, we can save a little bit of money. So. All right. It sounds really exciting. Yeah. Um, Looking forward to it. Please stay tuned if... Uh, you would like to get on our mailing list, you can go ahead and leave your email address in the comments. I'd be happy to put you on the mailing list so that you can be always updated when we're offering classes. Um, like I said, this one will be a five-week class, two and a half hours 
uh, most likely on a Wednesday night in Benicia. So um, it, it limits it a little bit to the local people. However, I'm sure weekend workshops will be um, happening before you know it. When we get a timeline, we'll send that uh, email out so you'll know what to expect. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It'll be fun. You'll have a good time. We yeah. always have a good time. So let's um, take some time and watch you do your process a little bit just to get a little taste of what people might be in for when they take the class. Yeah. And do you want to take a kind of quick, uh, you know, I've got some pieces hanging up here also that you can take maybe a quick pan and just kind of show uh, little samples of All right. ones so Why don't you explain the paintings as we go around? Okay, sounds good. So um, this piece here um, is from our Desert Road series. Um, and this is where I've used a real heavy pulp and I haven't ground it down and a real thick pour of plaster. And then I took tire treads that we got from our road trip when we were driving through the desert. And then I did an imprint while the plaster was wet with these heavy tire treads. And um, then I have layers of Venetian plaster. I have some old accounting books of mine, um, full circle. Um, I am about ready to retire. And uh, then I've transferred some carved in blocks um, that I have of uh, Alino blocks that I've used and I carved certain images and I've transferred up there and down here on the bottom. These are transfers of actual plaster. Then I've sanded and burnished back in. And then in the middle section, I set up a uh, much smoother plaster of Paris to kind of give the effect of a tire and a road and how it looks. And what do you have next to you over here? Well, this is a, a, a style that is a little older, and this style here was just a basic steeping process on the horizon lines that I set up. And uh, this has a very pulpy wood surface and a lot of texture. And I set this up fresco style. And then I went back in three or four times and did new layers with Venetian plasters, Sumi ink, and the rust solution primarily on this one. And, and these um, it was a newer series that I started actually when we first moved into these studios uh, from our Venetia studio. And they have multiple layers of Venetian plasters with a rough plaster underneath. So lots of Venetian plaster on top and uh, the dimples and stuff um, occur from the uh, rougher surfaces below. And what's next to you over here? This was an, actually, this is an older version. This was a... Uh, a transparent quartz plaster that I got my hands on quite a long time ago and I kept this um, and just stained it very light and did it fresco style and stabilo pencil and a rust solution and then I scraped back through it to get this veiling effect. Great. So this one here, I, uh, this is an older version where I have quite a lot of bit of paint and a faux plaster finish that I was playing with. Um, they have these faux plaster uh, packages that you can buy but I don't like how they work, but they were interesting enough and they worked really well with paint. And this is a recent piece. I've just finished these. This is pure plaster. Um, this piece I'm working on currently, and this one's just been finished. And again, these are pure plasters. And you can see the opulence uh, that these surfaces have. And this is the blue I was talking about earlier, how shiny it can get. Excellent. Let's see a little work. Okay. Well, one thing about plaster is getting your, your materials prepped. Um, I've got a light molding paste from Golden right here ready, along with one um, spatula. I've got a bucket that I'm gonna make the mix in. I've got some water handy. I've got a pre-measured thing of water here so I, I don't use too much. And uh, this is the Plaster of Paris. You can find this at Ace Hardware or Home Depot. They have big bags you can order online too, 25, 50 pounds. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up a mix. And um, I have uh, some wood pulp here. This comes from tailings from a hardwood uh, person that I know that does a lot of woodwork. If you do woodwork, you can collect the wood. And I'm going to mix these shavings. I've got some sand here. And we're going to set up the base coat. So the first thing we're going to do is pre-measure. And I just know from experience that um, I'm going to just make a smaller batch here for this panel. 
this is probably a good cup to cup and a half. So a bowl. So I'm gonna I set up one uh, bowl of plaster of Paris. Now I'm gonna do probably about one one bowl of the wood pulp. And just grind away. Pretty simple process. I just want to get it kind of smooth. Like that. And let's see, I have the pasta of Paris in here. And we'll just go ahead and throw that in there. Kind of like baking. And then I'll put in some sand. And the sand helps give it some strength and some binding ability. And I'll probably put in, um, you know, a half of sand in. So I want this one to be a little bit more papery. And I use the sifter because sometimes the sand gets a little bit of parts that don't go through, and I don't want real big lumps in this stuff. And we'll do that. Put things over here, out of the way. The house cleaning. Now comes the mix. So the first thing that I do is I hand stir it to kind of get the materials together. Okay? And this is not a hard process. But this allows me to get it more uniform. We don't want to get lumps um, as we do this. And then I kind of feel it and, you know, it should have kind of a dry, slippery feel to it. And that's from the wood pulp and the plaster of Paris, which tends to be slippery. And um, then we're going to put in a pigment. So um, I think what we'll do is I have um, a pigment here that is a red Bryce Canyon pigment. You can get this from American Clay. And this is what they use to uh, get different colors of clay. And then we got like, my little bowl. And here, the, the, the combination here would be uh, probably about a, a third of pigment to the amount of plaster that we put in, so maybe a third. And that gets mixed in. See, like cinnamon, right? try to keep these tops on because so I'm going to basically get this mixed in. Now you can mix the pigment with water first if you wish and then add it. But I find this process is better. It's a more uniform mixture. So I hand stir first. I have my stirring paddles. These are paint stirring paddles that you can buy in my drill, and it's set to go. I have a pre-measured amount of water. So this I'm probably only going to use about half of this, but I like to have a little bit more in case I need to add a little bit more. But this gives me an idea not to over overdo it. So you can see it's a little slurpy. And we want it to be a little bit like that, a little fleshy, not too stiff. Um, we're going to add now probably about the same cup. Um, I usually use the same amount of molding tape as I'm using um, for the plaster that I put in. So probably a, you know, one of those bowls and, you know, big measure in here and crack it. And this is the molding paste almost looks like Cool Whip. It's lightweight and it'll have a lot of sticking, adhesion, and flexibility to the plaster. We need that, especially if we're going to go on a canvas. And then I, I will kind of screw it in a little bit like that to start. And I'll use my mixer. Then um, I'll hand stir it. It should have a consistency kind of like oatmeal. 
Once you like your breakfast oatmeal in the morning, you want it to be thick and you know wet, but you don't necessarily want it to be really runny. Then we're going to apply it to the canvas. I should mention that um, when you are at this stage, um, you really want to be prepared to go full blow. You don't want any interruptions. Often, uh, Diane and I, we might poke our head in, you know, in the studio, and it's like, I can't talk now. <laughs> this thing is going to start setting up fast. I made this just a little bit drier, so you can see um, the spreading process. We're going to even it out over the canvas now. And you always, I kind of start from the middle and then work it to the edge. Because the edge, as you can see, it, it, it doesn't want to spread, it wants to go to the low point in the canvas. So we're going to have to work it out a little bit, kind of like frosting a cake. And I can add water, and I'll, I'll do that. Um, you want a spray bottle of water candy. So we'll just spread it out, and you don't want to get too precious with this, you know, but you do, you kind of just want to, what you're really looking for here is to even out. One thing that I didn't do with this canvas that I normally do is uh, tape the sides first. Normally I would have tape on the side. So I skipped that process for this demo, which means that uh, when I go to clean this, I'm going to have to do a lot of sanding on the side. But, you know, it's okay. It will work. Remember with plaster, this is time-based. You have to take your time and, you know, it just doesn't happen right off the bat. And just try to get your corners good. On plaster, the, the, the edges are a little tricky because they want to um, be thin. So I kind of work work the plaster and then I try to leave a little bit for the edge. I can clean my uh, knife like that and get it on. In the next stages, we'll let this sit just a little bit. And this is a good time where I go out and I have to rinse and clean my bucket. So we're going to take a, a few short minutes to do that and we'll be right back with you. Plaster and I've got my bucket clean. It gave it enough time to set up. I'm using a plastic uh, trowel here, and I'm going to get the first smooth. And it's already setting up fast. You can hear it. I may have to move my metal one, but I wet the surface. And this is like a concrete finishing techniques. You know, basically you're. Um, moving the material in the slip, which is the uh, mud that's fine in the silt, will rise to the top of the heavier parts and go to the bottom of the canvas. And this will allow us to finish the surface. Can you see the surface here? How much smoother it's getting? Just from this initial. And now, basically, I just want to even it out the best I can. Or not, that all depends. I can leave lines in it to create some visual effects later. But generally, I like to lay it out evenly and at least make sure that I have an even surface, um, even if it's going to be a little rough. I just use the scraper. I pull up higher to scrape. And I go flatter to get it smoother, and water is the lubricant. Okay, now I'll switch my blade to a finer metal blade. And this will further um, allow me to get it even smoother. You can hear the texture as I pull it. Oh, um, you get a good uh, visual here. It's almost becoming suede-like. Almost like suede. That's the effect I'm looking for. Um, I usually leave some lines in. 
Um, here's a point where I dug it, and I'll have to repair that, and I can pull some of the plaster off the side here. Um, look at that surface. Beautiful. And now we'll have to let it sit and wait. And this is the uh, first step in the plaster for fine arts process and the fundamentals that we're going to be setting up. Um, the next step will be to take to the next level. We have options and we'll discuss them. So stay tuned. We'll be producing that after this sets up and dries for uh, 24 hours or so. Sometimes it takes 48 depending on humidity. So be patient. Um, please press uh, the subscribe uh, on our channel and there's a bell for notifications and you can hit that to get any of our upcoming classes and information and other uh, videos that we'll be presenting. Thanks. Practice makes perfect. Um, so you have to come into the studio and do the practice.